Humanity started small, using agriculture to change the world to suit our needs. Each new step seemed bigger and more ambitious, so let's take a look at what grand projects the future might have in store. So today we begin a new series looking at how we could apply to our own world some of the technologies we've discussed for terraforming and colonizing other worlds. A key point we make about terraforming is that when you're done, the planet is very changed, not the world it was plus some grass and trees, but with everything down to the mountains altered. And that's part of why I decided to name this series about remaking our world, Earth 2.0. In this series, we'll cover colonizing oceans, greening deserts, thawing polar lands, and overhauling several other sorts of terrain. We will explore motivations for such projects, as well as the impacts on connected ecosystems and the hazardous uncertainties. There is obviously a huge moral dimension to renovating the Earth and impacting the lives of its inhabitants, but we're mostly going to skim or bypass ethical matters. We'll be assuming the role of engineers and mega-architects, exploring what we can do and how we could do it, but leaving the ethical aspects for everyone to ponder on their own. Also, while our focus is Earth, many of these methods will be viable on other planets, so perhaps some that shouldn't be used here might be usable someday on an uninhabited planet. We'll be beginning with oceans, very appropriate since they cover most of the planet. In fact, they are far too big to cover in a single episode, so we'll wait until episode 2 before we head very far from shore or dive deep down. Today we will focus on seasteading, offshore structures, and artificial islands. This isn't entirely a futuristic topic, as even ancient cultures built extensions on coastal land or reclaimed islands by filling them in with dirt and retaining walls. Indeed, we've reclaimed large chunks of land with dikes, and we'll look at creating artificial reefs today as a variation on that. There's a long history of ships at sea, or unpopulated small islands, being fairly independent of any nation, even if just unofficially. A ship's crew, sailing around the seas, might hail from a dozen different lands and change its flag as many times throughout a journey. The net effect is a tradition that once you're a certain distance from a land, its laws no longer apply. One of the major motivations to create living and working space at sea is precisely to be free from any existing national jurisdiction or create a new one. The flip side is that a country can attempt to extend its borders and jurisdiction by wrapping a sea in islands it has built, something that has generated quite a bit of international legal debate that we won't get into here. There have even been some attempted micronations like Sealand, a decommissioned anti-aircraft platform in the North Sea, occupants of which declared it a sovereign nation in 1975, complete with a flag and an anthem. It's never been officially recognized, but laws evolve, and a large populous floating structure or completely artificial island might have a better claim and stand a chance of being recognized. Being an independent nation has some obvious advantages and an artificial island is an attractive place for more than just casinos, tax shelters, pirate servers, or activities that are illegal elsewhere. Controversial or dangerous research you might have difficulty doing elsewhere might fit. We often discuss mental or physical augmentation processes like genetic or cybernetic engineering, and it wouldn't be surprising if a lot of the R&D or initial clinics offering such services were done offshore not just to avoid possible legal restrictions either. Genetically engineered crops or extinct species we'd return via cloning can be more easily contained this way to avoid contaminating ecosystems. Similarly, a lot of obstacles to private space launches come from regulations, mostly pretty reasonable ones, that countries tend to have about such things. Most of those do relate to issues from ground-based launches or being close to populated areas so sea-based launches are doubly attractive in that regard. Now, most of these are of limited scope, it's handy to have maybe a dozen offshore launch pads or clinics or casinos, but there's no reason one would fill the ocean with tens of thousands of such places. However, 
these do represent the motivation and funding sources for initial efforts. Like any colony effort, those early projects are where you do your learning to make future islands better and cheaper, but they also color and flavor future efforts and the cultures that grow up around them. Not too many folks live in Jamestown, Virginia farming tobacco, or Salem or Plymouth, Massachusetts burning witches, nor are most Australians prison convicts, but for good or ill those earlier colonial efforts had a massive impact on the civilizations that arose from them. So I tend to find it amusing that a lot of the initial motivation to create cities in the seas is likely to be a desire to circumvent laws. We'll explore other motivations to do more extensive settlements in a moment. First, we should note what sort of types of sea-based habitats we have. The simplest ones begin with working with what you already have. You can extend land from shore by constructing dikes and pumping the water out. You can build peninsulas or bridges to islands this way too, but it does take a lot of rock and dirt to make a new chunk of land, and more the deeper out you go. If you want to build a square kilometer of new land out where the ocean is a kilometer deep, you need a cubic kilometer of rock, indeed more than that since it will need to expand out near the base like a cone or pyramid, not a cylinder or cube as wide at the top as the bottom on the ocean floor. Such a foundation might need to be a few cubic kilometers, or a few billion cubic meters, each massing a few tons. One might easily need 10 billion tons of material requiring hundreds of billions of dollars in costs just to dig it up, move it, and dump it into the sea, already giving this island a land value parallel to land prices in the most expensive parts of our most developed metropolises. Needless to say, it's cheaper near land where the seafloor is a lot less deep, but out deep your island building is likely to either involve island reclaiming or more artificial processes. Island reclaiming is where most of the material is already there, and you're just adding some and flattening out higher up places to end with more land. There are many islands that could be expanded this way, and just as many that don't quite reach the surface. There are whole chains of undersea mountains and volcanoes, and these could be added to, slicing rock from mountains to put into the sea potentially lets you get twice the living area since you can terraform those mountains, but we'll save that along with activating volcanoes to create islands for a later episode. Alternatively, if you want to go deep out in the sea, far from any island, regular or submerged, and be connected to the ocean floor, you might opt to go more for metal scaffolding. Offshore platforms are often simply a structure or island built up on stilts or a framework tower. Now an obvious variation is a structure which simply floats, a large ship essentially but you might anchor one to the seafloor with tethers, or build much more vertically than a typical ship by having large and deep pontoons it rested on. This one is interesting because you could have your island be quite elevated, floating in the air not on the seashore, with support sinking down to those pontoons if you want mobility, or the ocean floor if not. So you could sail right under one and protect the island from large waves during storms. Beyond that, for those that are basically big ships or reclaimed islands, verticality doesn't come to the equation much, but if you're building your islands either by dumping rock and dirt to form a traditional one or making a framework tower, there's a lot more reason to go vertical as you are doing so anyway. We'll save a lot of the discussion of undersea habitats for next time, but it's worth noting that an artificial island that is not floating is not likely in most cases to be a single flat layer but rather one built up as much as a downtown metropolis, and down too. Indeed where buoyancy is concerned, you need to make sure you're building down as much as up. And while waterproofing and corrosion are concerns, building down into water is a lot easier than down into dirt and rock. So these islands might more resemble arcologies than a simple, flat, traditional island. So let's discuss some more motivations for moving into the seas. First, for the floating structures at least, there is mobility. You can't move a city, you can move a cruise ship though or a drilling platform. 
One might imagine a giant floating stadium that toured the Atlantic seaboard or Mediterranean for hosting major sporting events or other types of events like carnivals or festivals that do better by touring areas rather than staying still. Mobile amusement parks or racetracks or other things which are hard to pack up and move normally but financially do better by being mobile. Museums come to mind, one on a boat can visit a town for a month or so then move to the next where it's new and novel. Similarly, platforms for resource extraction or fishing might want to move around to reach new resources or avoid overfishing an area. But there's a second part of mobility. A city can't move, but neither can its components. I can't rearrange a city, but a floating island could easily consist of many modular platforms that could attach, detach, and rearrange. One might imagine a standardized set of platform modules, presumably square or hexagonal, able to be rearranged or moved to other floating cities entirely. Indeed, you likely want to build floating islands like this anyways in order to solve some of the problems caused by being supported purely by the ocean's surface. While you could imagine a lot of these would include drawbridges with associated utility hookups for power and water, it's possible boats or amphibious vehicles may be used instead of cars. This sounds like something a little out there, but actually it's been done before and is still done today by the Euros people who live on floating islands on the highest inland lake in the world, Lake Titicaca in South America. They've been living this way for thousands of years. If your neighbor is giving you grief, it's a relatively simple matter of detaching your part of the floating island from theirs and floating away. It makes for a good change of scenery and better neighbor relations when you can literally choose who your neighbors are and change your mind later too. For that matter, there are a lot of folks who opt to live in recreational vehicles, RVs, especially when retired, and if they don't like their neighbors, they can just move to a different lot. It should be noted that RV size is mostly limited by vehicle size. But as automated vehicles come into play, a person might be able to bring a large modular house along with them in a long caravan of self-driving vehicles that reattach at the destination. However, houseboats and ships are less constrained by size, hence oil supertankers and aircraft carriers, so we can supersize this idea. We could have floating islands that can move around and attach and detach based on the desires of the residents. Say some residents want to go to the tropics, but we decide we want to go skiing, other folks are in constant search for temperate weather, not too hot, not too cold. No problem, we just get together with the ones that want to head to the quarter climbs while everyone else goes with the tropics. We wave goodbye and the various groups go their separate ways, possibly to join up again at some point in the future. Humans are wanderers by nature, bound to land once we developed agriculture, but in the future, you could potentially take your farm with you. Speaking of travel, another motivation is stops along the way. Planes wanting to cross the Atlantic or Pacific have to make a very long voyage and be configured to that, and fly certain routes. The flight network changes a bit if someone builds or reclaims an island big enough to land a large jet on in the middle of the ocean. Since jet fuel is less dense than water, Keeping supplies on hand actually adds to your buoyancy, allowing more overall mass too. This is the basic concept of an aircraft carrier after all, you're just going bigger and more civilian, an artificial oceanic airport city complete with hotels and recreation. It's also worth remembering that aircraft carriers aren't our only example of floating islands that already exist. We've got some rather large collections of garbage floating around our oceans and it's a lot easier to clean such things up, possibly even profitably, if you've got safe ports of call closer at hand, ones already equipped to recycle or process such material. This is another motivation, although there are some advantages to doing manufacturing at sea, the big disadvantage is that factory workers don't want to take a ship or plane to work every day. However, as automation improves you need fewer folks, not all of whom would need to be on site and the bigger the facility, the more comforts you can offer those who do need to stay there. The biggest advantage of manufacturing at sea is cooling, since you've got an effectively unlimited supply of coolant on hand, something also handy for computing and server farms. 
As energy itself becomes less of a bottleneck on human production, getting rid of heat is going to become an increasing problem for us, and as a rule, people live in warmer places. Throughout the series, as we visit inhospitable parts of the planet and try to make them more livable, we will note that they often have advantages for manufacturing or computation. It's worth remembering one lesson we learned in the Outward Bound series while looking at settling planets. Colonizing a planet does not necessarily mean many people live there. Turning an entire exotic planet or moon, like Mercury or Titan, into a huge mine, factory, or computing engine is still colonizing it, and is probably a better use of that resource as opposed to terraforming it for human habitation. Of course power on the seas is a concern since we're not a civilization with cheap and abundant power quite yet. One can, for instance, float solar panels near an artificial island, withdrawing them when it's dark, you're moving, or there are storms. We've already demonstrated floating solar farms for powering civilization on land, but they seem to suffer from the same problems as solar does everywhere. Wind power is a bit better, and of course one can extract power from the motion of the sea itself. Floating nuclear reactors are already a proven technology, we use them to power our navies and icebreakers, but are unpopular near densely populated areas. Of course, air conditioning uses up a lot of power, and if we minimize that use by following a temperate climate, we limit our energy footprint too. We'll see next time that there's some good power options for deep down in the sea, such as nuclear, but one worth mentioning for now is that if you're using big cables or pylons to anchor yourself in place, there's an option for using geothermal with those too. The important aspect is that you can generate power any place you have a temperature difference between two spots, and the thermocline between the upper layer of the ocean and everything a kilometer deep or more is rather sharp. Even ignoring that if you are down on the ocean floor once you connect down to it, you are already a lot deeper and closer to the Earth's mantle than we usually go for geothermal. This makes hydrothermal, or using that temperature difference throughout the depth of our ocean to generate power, an attractive option for these structures. Many of these methods would also combine well, and it's nice to have multiple generation methods, diversity in power sources is never a bad thing. However, a more likely approach might be biofuels, particularly for export, and this brings up sea farming. The oceans are vast, and have lots of life. But the further you get from shore, the more that drops off. There's plenty of light, but there's just not much nutrients, they're all the way down where the sun doesn't reach to. Many of the ocean's ecosystems rely on some species that are very good at extracting dilute nutrients from water. We can enhance this process artificially by taking something of an iceberg approach. Icebergs are slightly less dense than seawater, so they float but only a little bit sticks out. Similarly, we could build a relatively small and cheap area above water for people that was connected to a vast underwater mesh that let light in and had nutrients, and was good at extracting those from the water and keeping them. These need be little more than lots of nets which can absorb nutrients and act as a place for plants to anchor themselves to, however we might go more elaborate and use thicker branches akin to roots but acting backwards in that we might pump nutrients like nitrogen down to them. Nitrogen produced by using wind or solar as the power source. Up on the island, which I will call a jellyfish island, you have the normal human habitat with houses, factories, shopping centers, and civic buildings. Down below you have a much wider region in which algae, a great source for biofuel, and other plants grow, attracting fish and setting up a nice mobile sea farm. Extra biomass can be used for biofuel, and it will leak some down to lower levels of the sea as marine snow, the food source for things living far deeper than the sun can reach. The jellyfish part comes from it potentially having long tentacles it might use to anchor itself in place and also to scrape the ocean floor for nutrients it can haul up. But another aspect of such a place is that it isn't just farming, it is mining too. The oceans contain a lot of metals, even precious and rare earth metals. Ocean extraction, the process of filtering out those metals from the water or getting them off the seafloor, has come a long way in recent years, and could be a competitive source for some materials we want, particularly lithium for batteries and fusion. Should we get an even better power source, like fusion, 
we might extend our farms a good way deeper, providing them light where the sun can't reach, something we often refer to as vertical reefs here. We'll save that for the following episode, but it's amusing since some jellyfish glow, and so might their man-made island analogs. Now I chose Jellyfish Island after likening them to icebergs because we might have actual iceberg islands, albeit temporary ones. We'll be looking at turning the desert green once we're done discussing the oceans, and desalinating seawater to do that is very energy intensive, but the bigger an iceberg is, the longer it can last without melting as it drifts south, and the less of its water is lost proportionally in the process. We might drag icebergs south, letting the current do most of the work, but giving them a nudge and carefully cutting them off in the first place at an ideal size and time. Such things might be ideal for bringing fresh water to places that are short on it, and we might be able to wrap them up to melt slower. There's also something amusing about the idea of parking an iceberg off the coast of Los Angeles and running a ski slope on it for people to visit. That's a big thing to remember throughout this. It's nice if you can find a single thing that provides the economic incentive to build such a place, but you'll always be looking for additional uses too. They make marginal or unprofitable options profitable, and make profitable ones very profitable, and more economically diverse and resistant to market disruptions. Cities that rely on a single industry are very vulnerable, that's exactly how you end up with ghost towns. So if you can have a ski resort you can stick on your icebergs and a silver farm taking advantage of the cold for computation, and a casino and a trailing pack of dolphins and whales for people to visit, you do better. Now this is more deep blue than coastal, and in truth extending our coastlines is probably the path we'll use the most, but I think the deep blue holds a special interest in this topic, because folks want to run off and set up their own nations, and I should note that in the long term, that's probably a losing bet. Start nation building at sea so you can make your own, and other countries are going to start pressuring you to sign treaties and follow international customs, like having customs and other regulations, and they do have some muscular ways of encouraging cooperation if need be. You're probably out of luck if you get invaded by one and try to complain to others when you've been smugly acting as a port of call for illicit doings, smuggling and tax evasion. Of course we do have such places now too, hence offshore accounts. Moreover, nations have citizens, and citizens typically are in favor of those laws and regulations, that's generally why we have so many. They just kind of accumulate every time something happens and the population tells their leadership to fix it. So even left on its own, some new autonomous oceanic city-state is probably going to start taxing, regulating, and restricting things, and this is all assuming you don't get annexed. There are a lot of advantages to being a citizen or province of a major nation after all, and whole new ones might emerge just in the seas. You might have a nation of Atlantis, some big country composed of hundreds of floating city-states, or existing countries might simply create whole new states on top of the ocean. Since such things are likely to be small and incremental though, you might most often see states and provinces expand this way. It would be very easy to imagine the state of Hawaii expanding by reclaiming undersea islands in the archipelago. Back on the coast though, people might be moving those coasts. As mentioned, we've been reclaiming land with dikes for a long time, and rising sea levels might encourage a lot of R&D and economy of scale to develop cheaper and improved versions of that technology. We also have break walls, meant to protect places from strong waves and cut down on erosion but a break wall has the potential to be its own ecosystem, and this is what the typical reef or barrier island is after all. Instead of just dumping rock there, you can tweak it a little to be nicer for sea life to latch onto, or for farming too. You could put wind turbines on them as a power source, but you can also take advantage of tidal generators. A tidal generator is a simple device, tides come in and water rises, filling tanks, and when it goes out, Water levels drop and leave those tanks, spinning a turbine and making power, quite a lot of it too. So one might opt to skip traditional break walls of solid rock and instead build huge hollow tanks for water to fill, with turbines for tidal power, wind turbines on top of it, and build the exterior to be perfect for aquatic life to latch onto. You can also strain those tanks for nutrients and valuable metals while you're at it, or skip the wind turbines 
and build some expensive coastal housing there. Indeed, if you did that, you might decide to build a second break wall further out, then do it again, and again, adding to your land by adding layer after layer. We'll call these Mulberry Coasts in memory of the Mulberry Artificial Harbors deployed in World War II that allowed huge fleets to rapidly dock and dispatch their troops and gear in places where normal landing wasn't really an option. You end up with layer after layer of long, thin islands branching out from the cities, protecting them against rising sea levels, storm surges, or even tsunamis, and doubtless with breaks and bridges to let you travel in between by land or sea. Not a simple break wall, but places hundreds of feet wide, probably with a road down the middle and houses on each side, each maybe even with its own little cove and beach, each very rich in sea life. This seems like a very economical approach that ought to have many advantages to it and provide solutions to many of today's problems. I could imagine us doing this all along the thousands of kilometers of coast out for dozens of layers for many kilometers out. Amusingly, you could do it inward too, and if you prefer fresh water instead of seawater, you can simply make sure one layer is cut off from the sea. This is a good approach for cheap water storage for places that have shortages at certain times of year, and you could use tidal generators to power that desalination too. There is a reason why humans tend to live close to the seas, it's not just because boats make for easy transport, we've got trains and planes too after all, but because people like living on the coast, and there's a limited supply of it. We like living next to coves, wide rivers, and small lakes too, so much so that Mulberry Coast might be very popular residentially. Your ideal planet, in terms of land values, and biomass for that matter, is not one of vast oceans or continents, but lots of archipelagos of snaky islands with thousands of kilometers of shoreline. I could easily see Earth, in the centuries ahead, slowly moving to that format, filling the oceans with lots of thin islands, traditional or floating ones, while slicing thick canals and new lakes or seas into the coasts or inhospitable tracts of land. Again, that's why this is the Earth 2.0 series. We're not really looking at small changes, but huge ones that can remake the entire planet. For this first episode, I wanted to focus on something that could be done today or in the near future and progress incrementally with our current tech and resources, but as we go through the series, we'll be covering everything from vast subterranean cities to ones on top of mountains or inside them, warm oases in arctic lands to cities floating in the sky or even whole continents built in orbit or shells of new land around the planet. You're going to need to be inventive and resourceful to make life work on an artificial island, and it helps to have a strong math and science skill set. To master those skills, it helps to engage in active learning and have a framework for how all these concepts fit together. Our sponsor for this episode, Brilliant, places a focus on making sure their courses show how math and science is applicable to real life problems and has that as one of its core pillars for education. It's far easier to understand science when you can see problems and scenarios it applies to and how. When you truly understand the math and science behind these concepts, you can see many novel ways to apply it, and that's where so many of the concepts we discuss here come from. If you want to enhance your own skills and understanding, you can go to brilliant.org slash Isaac Arthur and sign up for free. And also, the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. A point to remember as we talk about changing our planet is that the cultures change too. We mentioned that in regard to how early autonomous micronations in the sea might influence the cultures that arose around them as they grew. Next week we'll be looking at how that might affect interstellar colony ships, as while those are meant to settle new worlds, they spend so much time traveling to them, often centuries or more, that they develop their own new culture specific to living in a generation ship. We'll be exploring those changes and what you can do to minimize them or direct them in a way that will still accomplish the mission, as well as discussing just how long you can send a ship out for and expect it to last, in the Million Year Arc. The week after that, we will return to this topic and finish exploring the sea in Colonizing the Oceans, and look at some more options and what we can do deep down on the seafloor, not just the top. 
for alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications bell. And if you enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button and share it with others. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.